still got a few more things to come up. And you let me know when you're ready. Okay. As soon as I see Duke Law School, I get that enough time. Let's see what's going on. I, I know it will. Let's see. Uh, Eric, listen. All right, you've got at least 10 seconds worth. <laughs> Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, let me remind you that if you read the papers this morning, the Senate yesterday passed its version of a FISA reform bill. And in that bill, the Senate included retroactive immunity for the telephone and communication companies that assisted the Bush administration in uh, its surveillance program. The House passed a bill last year that does not have that provision in it. So all of us are waiting to see what happens. And it's particularly interesting because the previous time that the Congress tried to fix the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act on the 4th of August of last year, it put in a sunset provision. And that sunset provision, for those of you who are familiar with it, means it terminates unless it's automatically reauthorized by Congress. And that sunset provision will hit at the stroke of midnight on Friday night. So it ought to be interesting to see what happens, whether the House will agree with what the Senate's going to do. I'm told that there are some congressmen who are not really happy about retroactive immunity to the phone companies. But all this is to say that I can't think of any more topical subject for you to hear about today than the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that Congress passed back in 1978. This program, by the way, is sponsored by the National Security Law Society, the Federalist Society, and the Duke Bar Association. And you've already been told about the delivery of the pizza, which should be here very quickly. Bob Turner is the Associate Director of the Center for National Security Law at the University of Virginia, as well as a professor in the general faculty at the University of Virginia Law School. He, along with Professor John Norton Moore, co-founded the Center of National Security Law up at Virginia. That was back in 1981. And, he's, and Bob has served as its associate director ever since then, uh, except for a couple of stints in government service in the 80s. And 1994-95, uh, uh, he was the uh, Stockton Professor of International Law at the Naval War College up in Newport, Rhode Island. That's in the summer, that's not a bad place to be. Uh, he's a veteran of two army tours in Vietnam, served as a research associate and a public affairs fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institute on War, Revolution, and Peace, before spending five years in the mid-70s as a national security advisor to Senator Robert Griffin, a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, he's also served in the Pentagon as special assistant to the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy in the White House as counsel to the President's Intelligence Oversight Board, at the State Department as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Legislative Affairs and as the first President of the Congressionally Authorized United States Institute of Peace. Uh, Professor Turner has also served three times as the Chairman of the ABA's Standing Committee on Law and National Security. Uh, he teaches undergraduate courses at Virginia in International Law, U.S. Foreign Policy, and the Vietnam War. All this is to say that uh, our speaker today has been very instrumental in the evolution and development of what we call national security law. And some of you have either are, have taken it or are taking it under me this semester. Uh, it's a burgeoning field. What, back in 1974, there were only six or seven law schools that taught anything like it. Uh, that was 84. Uh, uh, 1984. 84, yeah. Now there are probably 125 or 130 that are teaching some variant of it. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Professor Turner and Professor Moore's center in 1981 was the leading academic center and the first one uh, of which our center here at Duke was modeled. So uh, it's a great personal pleasure, professional privilege to introduce our speaker who, by the way, has a birthday tomorrow. So Bob, welcome. He's not really that smart. He remembers tomorrow's my birthday because tomorrow's his birthday, too. He's, he's my big brother. He's a year older than I am. But we each year, we uh, early in the morning, one of us remembers and sends the other one a birthday note. So I told him, this year I'm going to one-up you and come down here and do it in person. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, you have the great fortune of having at your law school not only one of the uh, 
dozen best law schools in the country, but uh, a center for law ethics and national security that is second to none. I, uh, when Scott set it up, we had we had already taken the title Center for National Security Law, and I, I just can see it now. Uh, you know, 20 years after I die, somebody's going to find one of my books and say, "Oh, he was at National Security. Which one was he? Was he the one that believed in ethics or the other one?" You know, it's a. Uh, it's, it's very uh, uh, disconcerting. Anyway, I'm going to go quickly today and try to cover a lot of material, assuming my, there we go. Uh, there's an awful lot of material here. You're not going to understand the second part if you don't get the first part, and I would bet you money you're not taught the first part here. Uh, I may be wrong. It's, I, won't, I won't mention Scott's classes because I don't know what he teaches, but most professors of con law don't even discuss the primary basis for the president's authority in foreign affairs. I'm going to explain where it comes from, how it comes from, and try to convince you that was the view, at least, of the founding fathers. Now, I'm going to focus on constitutional issues. There's statutory arguments. If you want to raise them, I may have to talk to you out in the hall, but I'll be happy to, to, to address those also. Does the Constitution empower the president to collect foreign intelligence? I think the answer to that is yes. If so, can Congress take away that power by a mere statute? I think the answer to that is no. See, the exam is going to be very easy in this class. I want to start off with a modern myth. How many times have we heard that in a democracy or a republic, there can be no unchecked presidential power? The president is not above the law. He has to do what Congress tells him to do. Do we have a king? Do we have another King George? Uh, have we forgotten Marbury versus Madison? Or have you read one of the case books that ex excludes this excerpt from it? In Marbury versus Madison, perhaps the most famous of all Supreme Court cases, John Marshall noted that the Constitution gives the president certain important political powers in the exercise of which he's to use his own discretion and is accountable only to his country and his political character, that is, we can vote him out if he runs for re-election, and to his conscience. Whatever opinion may be entertained on the manner in which executive discretion may be used, there exists and can exist no power no power in Congress, no power in the courts to control that discretion. Now, that's not technically true. We have the power to amend the Constitution anytime we want to. But Congress is limited and the courts are limited in this area of foreign affairs, especially, although the pardon power is another example. Who remembers the one exception to the pardon power? There's a $2 bill in it if you get it right. Too late. Oh, you're there. Come on up real quick and get your $2 bill. And remember that April 13th is Thomas Jefferson's birthday. And no matter how hard you try, Duke will never have Thomas Jefferson, so we're always going to have something on you. Congratulations. Well done. Anyway, that's something I do for, especially for my undergraduates. And I've run into some that say I still have that bill you gave me back in the 80s, so it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. There is one exception. You cannot pardon for impeachment. Otherwise, Congress cannot control the pardon power. The Senate cannot... Uh, uh, it, it's an exclusive power. Now, uh, in discussing this, John Marshall went on to say, or he goes on to say, uh, the, the acts of the Secretary of Foreign Affairs slash Secretary of State as an officer can never be examinable by the courts. Being entrusted to the executive, the decision of the executive is conclusive. That's pretty extreme language. Uh, sadly, it's left out of a lot of case books. And as an example, sorry, let me go back because I, I left this out. Uh, he says... The application of this remark uh, will be perceived by examining the act of Congress setting up the Department of Foreign Affairs. In other words, he's pointing out these presidential prerogatives are especially uh, prominent in the area of foreign affairs. Uh, now, where do we find this power? Where in the Constitution is the president given all this broad control over foreign affairs? And the answer is very clear. Article 2, Section 1 says the executive power shall be vested in the president. Now, words are an imperfect instrument for conveying ideas. And over the centuries, sometimes words change and even reverse their meaning. When I, I did a 1,700-page SJD dissertation on foreign affairs in the Constitution, and I came across a letter by one of the founding fathers who I knew was just totally enamored with the Constitution, and yet he told his friend, it's awful. And my first thought was, somebody has put a letter by a, another guy with the same name in this guy's file, because this is not his view. But then I did a little work on the research on the etymology of the word awful. Go to any of the major English dictionaries today, the big thick ones, and they will give as a, an arcane definition, awe-inspiring, to fill one with awe, awful. 
Uh, and what he was saying is, my 14-year-old my understands, this is an awesome constitution. But if we today read that language and we see the word awful and interpret it as horrible, terrible, something like that, we are not going to understand what that man was trying to say. So it's important to understand words. And one of those words is the term executive power. The Founding Fathers understood the term executive power as that word was used by the leading scholars of their day. People like William Blackstone and Montesquieu and John Locke, Adam Smith, all of them said the control of what Locke called war, peace, leagues, and alliances has to be vested in the executive. Uh, uh, Locke coined the term federative power. Montesquieu and Blackstone referred to the two executive powers, the power to execute the municipal law and the power to carry out business under the law of nations, international law, international relations. And they argued that of necessity, this had to be vested in the executive. Why? Because Congress lacked, legislative bodies lacked the institutional competency to manage it. To effectively conduct the conduct of war, uh, intelligence, diplomacy, intelligence gathering, you need three things. You need unity of plan slash unity of design. You need secrecy, and you need speed and dispatch. And legislative bodies don't have any of those. Uh, Locke, Montesquieu, and Blackstone all considered the executive power to include foreign affairs. Now, I first got interested in this issue when I heard a lecture in 1966 by the late Quincy Wright, a very distinguished scholar in this area. And he wrote in his 1922 book, The Control of American Foreign Relations, that the works of Locke, Montesquieu, and Blackstone were the political bibles of the Constitutional Fathers. Ed Corwin was certainly one of the biggest con law scholars in the country of, in, the, in the mid 20th century. And he noted, again, what the, what the framers wanted was the constitution of Locke, Montesquieu, and Blackstone, which carried with it a broad range of autonomous executive power or prerogative. Lou Hinkin, a dear friend who's now retired but taught at Columbia for many years, in his 1972 book, Foreign Affairs in the Constitution, noted the executive power was not defined because it was well understood by framers raised on Locke, Montesquieu, and Blackstone. Now, how do we know the Founding Fathers actually accepted this view of executive power? Because they told us so. I can start with Madison in 1789, but let's just start with Jefferson, our first Secretary of Foreign Affairs. Washington asked Jefferson, he told him, hey, the Constitution says that I make treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate, and I appoint diplomats with the advice and consent of the Senate, but where are all of the other powers involving foreign affairs and diplomacy vested in the Constitution? And Jefferson wrote back and he said, the Constitution has declared, quote, the executive power shall be vested in the president, submitting only special articles to a negative by the Senate. The transaction of business with foreign nations is executive altogether. It belongs into the head of that department, except as to such portions as are specially submitted to the Senate. And he went on to say, as Madison had earlier and others would later, exceptions to the general grant of executive power are to be construed strictly. Madison's argument was, if you allow these exceptions to be broadly construed, you will destroy separation of powers, and ultimately, Congress will seize all powers of government. And of course, in Federalist 47, uh, uh, Madison referred to the concentration of all powers in the same hands as being the definition of tyranny. Three days later, Washington wrote in his diary that he had discussed Jefferson's memo with Chief Justice John Jay, who obviously didn't know about advisory opinions, and uh, James Madison, the Republican leader in the House of Representatives, and he wrote, uh, they, their views, you know, they accept, they share Jefferson's view uh, to wit that the Senate have no constitutional right to interfere in this area of diplomacy, save for their specific powers of an approbation or disapprobation on the person nominated by the president. All the rest being executive, invested in the president by the Constitution. Where in the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1? And I would wager that not, Scott excluded, I don't know what he does in this area, but I'll bet most of your professors don't even discuss this as a source of authority. Three years later, Alexander Hamilton wrote in his first Pacificus letter, as the participation of the Senate in the making of treaties and the power of the Congress to declare war are exceptions out of the general, quote, executive power vested in the president, they are to be construed strictly and not to be extended no further than is essential to their execution. So what do we have here supporting the premise that the executive power clause gave the president essentially complete control over foreign intercourse, what, what Locke called war, peace, leagues, and alliances, save for the very important 
but narrowly construed exceptions vested in Congress and the Senate. Well, we've got the first president, who was also president of the Constitutional Convention. We've got the first and third chief justices, John Marshall and John, John Jay and John Marshall. We've got the heads of the, of the Federalists, Washington, and of the Republicans, Jefferson. We've got all three authors of the Federalist Papers. And as we will see, we've got Congress as well. And yet modern case books uh, often don't even mention this as a source of power. Now, this is an example of how the system worked, and this will shock some of you. Jefferson wrote as Secretary of the Treasury 15 years into the new government. The Constitution has made the executive the organ for managing our intercourse with foreign nations from the origin of the government to this day. It has been the uniform opinion in practice. The whole foreign fund was placed by the legislature on the footing of a contingent fund in which they undertake no specifications but leave the whole to the discretion of the president. In other words, they would say, Mr. President, here is $40,000. Two years later, it was $50,000. To put it in perspective, that was 14% of the federal budget. What's the penalty of the defense budget today? It's about 5 6%, maybe something in that area? Yeah, 5%. Uh, it was a lot of money. And they told the president, this is yours. Conduct foreign affairs, hire spies, uh, conduct diplomacy. Uh, but before you can make a treaty, you've got to come back and show it to the Senate. And if one-third plus one of a quorum, as few as 17 senators, say no, you can't make that treaty. There were very important checks, and certainly Article I, Section 8, and Article I, Section 9 give the, the Congress itself tremendous powers. Uh, Congress has the power to define and punish uh, offenses against the law of nations. Tree or, or torture happens to be an offense against the law of nations under the, CAT, the Convention Against Torture and under the Geneva Conventions. Ergo, Congress clearly has the power to pass a law providing criminal punishment for, uh, uh, for torture. Uh, but this was the original understanding, uh, and it's very important to understand that. And I think I see pizza coming out there, and I know I'm going to be in trouble if we don't take about a three-minute break or a ten-minute break, whatever it takes. Grab your pizza. I may start a little bit uh, early, so uh, you know, keep the door open and you can probably hear, And because uh, I, I know we want to get out of here by... Uh, uh, in a little over half an hour, and I've got an awful lot of material I want to cover. And if you take your pizza and run, you're going to be in real trouble with the Federalist Society. They got some real big guys that'll. Uh, what are they going to do? They pass it around here? Yeah. That's better. I like that. Okay, then I'm going to keep going. Uh, and somebody was recording this, and she said, "Oh, expletive deleted. Look what he did." Okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's talk about the Supreme Court very briefly. Now we can spend a lot of time talking about Jackson's opinion in Steel Seizure. I would love to do that. It's not a foreign affairs case. If, if you raise it in Q&A, we'll talk about it. But let's start off with Curtis Wright. Curtis Wright, 1936, is by far the most frequently cited foreign affairs case by the Supreme Court. And in that case, the court noted, not only as we've shown is the federal power over external affairs, over foreign affairs, in origin and character different from that over internal affairs, but participation in the exercise of that power is significantly limited. And the court went on to say, into the field of negotiation, the Senate cannot intrude, and Congress itself is powerless to invade it. In other words, this is an exclusive presidential power. Congress cannot invade the field of diplomacy. Uh, and I would argue in the same sense, this is one of three core presidential areas that Congress cannot usurp. Uh, diplomacy, the, co the collection of foreign intelligence, and the conduct of military operations. Now, the president can violate the Constitution by launching an aggressive war without the approval of Congress, uh, but once war is begun, either by an attack from a foreign, gov foreign entity or by the, with the approval of Congress, the president conducts the war, and the Supreme Court in Hamdan reaffirmed that in, in quoting uh, Chief Justice Chase's opinion in uh, uh, ex parte Milligan. So there was a very broad consensus in all three branches until about the time of the Vietnam War. In my dissertation, I pick a major debate about every 10 years and show how um, members of Congress recognize this is the president's business. If a junior member, a first-term senator, would get up and propose a legislation to constrain the president in this area, a more senior member would get up and say, well, it's well known that Senator Jones aspires to be president. And if he becomes president, he can decide these issues, but until then, he should sit down and shut up. <laughs> I want to give you just one example of how this, con this consensus uh, held. 
Some of you may remember J. William Fulbright, although he was defeated for re-election in 1974, so I bet most of you don't remember him in person, and he's been dead for a number of years. He was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee from 59 to 74. He was the primary member of Congress who got us into the Vietnam War. He led the fight for that uh, authorization to go to war that was approved, by the way, by 99.6% of the Congress. So anybody who tells you that Vietnam was an illegal presidential war, uh, I'd like to have whatever they're smoking. Uh, anyway, Fulbright gave a speech at Cornell Law School in 59 in which he noted the preeminent responsibility of the president for the formulation and conduct of American foreign policy is clear and unalterable. Again, he's wrong, we can amend the Constitution, but short of that, it cannot be altered by Congress. He has, as Hamilton defined it, all powers in international affairs the Constitution does not vest elsewhere in clear terms. And note, he's not just saying the president is a tool or the agent of Congress in talking to government. Sure, it's more convenient to have one person doing the talk than 535. No, it's not just responsibility for, for the conduct, it's for the making or the formulation of foreign policy. Again, subject to certain very important checks. If he tries to make policy through a treaty, the Senate can block it. Uh, if he tries to appoint his brother uh, to be an ambassador, the Senate can block it by seeing that no unfit person. Of course, Kennedy appointed his brother and nobody said very much. Well, actually, they did say some things. Now, if you want more on this with all the footnotes, I've got a piece in 34 Virginia Journal of International Law, uh, 903. Uh, it was published in 94. So about 70 pages with lots more examples and details and footnotes. Now, what about intelligence? How do we know really? You know, the CIA wasn't created until 1947. I mean, you know, this is fairly new stuff, right? I assume everybody here knows that intelligence is the second oldest profession. Trust me, it is. And the Founding Fathers talked about it time and again. As early as, uh, it's not mine, I'm not here if it's for me. Uh, as early as uh, 1776, the Committee of, uh, of Secret Correspondence in the Continental Congress learned that France was going to engage in a major covert operation to help the American Revolution with money, arms, and other things. And what did the, the, four, the five members of this committee chaired by Ben Franklin do? They left a memo saying, we have decided we cannot share this information with others in Congress because we have learned by fatal experience that Congress consists of too many members to keep secrets. John Jay was by far our most experienced diplomat and had, had served as Secretary of Foreign Affairs under the Articles of Confederation, under the Continental Congress. He wrote one letter in which he described the Continental Congress. He said, there is as much intrigue in the state houses in the Vatican as little secrecy as in a boarding school. It was a serious problem. Of course, the British and French ambassadors, they didn't have all the ethics laws we have today, and they would routinely uh, gain some goodwill with members of Congress by loaning them money to buy nice homes. And lo and behold, uh, uh, it was not uncommon for information to be shared with them that was given to Congress, and Congress knew that. And in Federalist number 64, John Jay talked about what today we call protecting sources and methods. He said there are cases where the most useful intelligence may be obtained if those possessing it can be relieved from apprehensions of discovery. And he said there would be many who would have important information who would trust the secrecy of the Senate, but not that of, sorry, of the President, but not that of the Senate or a more numerous popularly elected House of Representatives, which of course today the Senate is. It's now popularly elected and is much larger than the original House. And he went on to say, therefore, the Constitutional Convention have done well in so disposing of the treaty powers that the President, quote, will be able to manage the business of intelligence in such manner as prudence may suggest. This is very clear language saying, Congress has nothing to do with intelligence. They can't be trusted with secrets. And so this is the president's uh, authority. And remember, the Federalist Papers were by far the most important source for understanding the new Constitution. Madison had elaborate notes from the convention, and there was the official journal, and a number of other people kept notes. But Madison's notes in the journals were not published until the 1830s, long after the Constitution had been ratified. This is the first appropriations bill for foreign intercourse, and this language was followed year after year. The president shall account specifically for all such expenditures of the said money as in his judgment may be made public and all for the, um, for the amount of other expenditures. Why account for the, why uh, report on the amount? So Congress could replenish the kitty and the president would have enough money to hire spies and conduct negotiations and so forth. Today, of course, Congress would say the president shall report 
all the government secrets under injunction of secrecy. Now, I spent uh, the, the latter months of 1984 and the early months of 85 as acting assistant secretary of state for congressional relations. I spent five years with the Foreign Relations Committee. We could spend the day talking about congressional leaks. You know, Congress you know, leaks like a sieve. Some people say they don't in the executive branch. They want to get money from them and work with them so they pretend it's not a problem. Uh, trust me, it's a problem. In 1818, a debate in the, on the House floor, Henry Clay said it would be improper for Congress to inquire into how the president spent money from his Secret Service Fund. Others supported that. No one disagreed with it. Now, can Congress take this away? This is a no-brainer. Article 5 of the Constitution tells us how we amend the Constitution. A unanimous Congress with the vote, approval of the president cannot amend the Constitution. And John Marshall, again, going back to Marbury, an act of the legislature repugnant to the Constitution is void. Ergo, yes, it is true. The president has the duty to see the laws faithfully executed. But an unconstitutional statute is not law. It's void. And thus, the president has no duty. And obviously, the president's oath to uphold the Constitution is a higher duty. And if he has to decide between a constitutional grant of power and a conflicting statute, he must obey the Constitution and defend it. Going back to Quincy Wright, who was president of the American Political Science Association, the American Society of International Law, the International Political Science Association, he was a heavy hitter. In 1922, he wrote, declarations of foreign policy may be enacted by Congress in the forms of joint resolutions, that is, as a statute. But such resolutions are not binding on the president. I can give you an uh, 1897 report from a House committee saying exactly the same thing. We may express our opinion on matters of foreign policy, but in so doing, we cannot bind the president, even if we do it by statute. Baron Blatt, the Supreme Court, noted Congress cannot inquire into matters which are within the exclusive province of one of the other branches of government. Imagine for a moment if Congress were to pass a law saying no money shall be available for the Supreme Court unless the justices appear before the House Judiciary Committee on demand and discuss ongoing cases and decide the cases as instructed by the chairman. That would be a usurpation of power, a violation of separation of powers. And yet Congress tries this routinely with presidential powers that are expressly granted in the Constitution, unlike the power of judicial review. Now, in 1968, Congress passed the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act, in which it specifically acknowledged the president's power in this area. It said, nothing in this chapter shall limit the constitutional power of the president to take such measures as he deems necessary to obtain foreign intelligence information. This didn't confer upon the president any power. Why? Because Congress didn't have the power to confer. That power was given to the president by the people through the Constitution, and Congress merely acknowledged it when they passed the first wiretap law in, chapter, in Title III of the 68 Crime Control Act. But they, they made it clear uh, that we are not limiting the president's constitutional power in this area. Now, twice since 67, the Supreme Court has had an opportunity to limit the president's collection of foreign intelligence, to say that requires a warrant and probable cause under the Fourth Amendment. It has refused to do so. The Third, Fourth, Fifth, and Ninth Circuit Courts of Appeals have considered cases in this area, and every one of them has said there is a foreign intelligence exception to the warrant requirement of the Fourth Amendment. Unanimous, the Courts of Appeals have said the President has this power. No Court of Appeals has ever held to the contrary. The sixth time since 1967, the Supreme Court has had, a, had an opportunity to declare that the president must get a warrant before he conducts foreign intelligence surveillance uh, in this country, and six times it has refused to do so. Classic case, U.S. versus Trung Dinh Hoang. Uh, David Trung was a Vietnamese national who came to the United States in 1966, moved to Berkeley, became an active figure in the anti-war movement. After we gave up, surrendered in Vietnam, and that's another speech, but we had the Vietnam War won by 1972, and a lot of former North Vietnamese and Viet Cong people have now acknowledged that. We had them on the ropes. And then Congress passed a law making it illegal to spend money on combat operations. Losing the war we had fought so hard to win and setting the stage for genocide that killed more people in three years than we lost, than were killed on all sides in the previous 14 years of war. But that's another speech. Anyway, 
You all remember the Carter, and from your history books, you remember the Carter administration, those great enemies of civil liberties and, and champions of, of national security state and so forth. That, that's a joke if you, if you don't remember them. Anyway, this is from the uh, uh, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. The government did not seek a warrant for eavesdropping on Trump. What did they do? They told the FBI to go into Trump's apartment, plant microphones, bug his telephone, go to his place of business, and set up a video camera. No warrant, not so much as an email to a federal judge. Why'd they do it? Well, the Court of Appeals noted the Carter administration relied upon a foreign intelligence exception to the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement. In this area of foreign intelligence, the government contends the president may authorize surveillance without seeking a judicial warrant because of his constitutional prerogatives in the area of foreign affairs. The district court accepted the government's argument that there exists a foreign intelligence exception to the warrant requirement, and the Court of Appeals then said, we agree with the district court. I mentioned there were two relevant Supreme Court cases. We've all studied cats, I'm sure, or you will before you get out of here when you study criminal procedure. In 1967, the Supreme Court held, overturning Olmstead, that yes, a wiretapping a phone booth was a seizure under the Fourth Amendment and therefore required a warrant. But footnote 23 to the majority opinion expressly dis distinguished the case from foreign intelligence cases, national security cases, and said we, we take no view on that, that's not before us. The Keith case in 1972, unanimous opinion by Justice Powell, uh, repeated, well, that case involved a domestic target. This was a, quote, White Panther. I don't know if you remember, I'm sure you all remember reading about the Black Panthers. Well, the White Panthers were white guys that wanted to be like the Black Panthers. And this particular guy blew up a CAA office in Ann Arbor, Michigan. They, they, they bugged him uh, without a warrant. And they found, when they finally arrested him, he had a car full of explosives and a map with military complexes circled on it, military installations. Got to court. His lawyer said, I uh, object to the introduction of this evidence that violated his Fourth Amendment rights, and lo and behold, Judge Keith, for whom the, Keith, the case is, is, is widely known, uh, said that's true. You have to, for domestic targets, you have to have a warrant. The Supreme Court unanimously upheld that, but twice in the case, the court said, we are not expressing any position on the issue of foreign intelligence, foreign powers, and their agents in this country. Uh, Lewis Powell actually set up, he was president of the ABA and set up the ABA committee that I chaired, that, that Scott mentioned, uh, and he used to come to some of our dinners and I had the, the, the pleasure of sitting next to him and we've talked about some of these issues. He strongly felt, and indeed he persuaded an ABA committee to, to write a report saying, yes, you need a warrant for a purely domestic target that has no ties to foreign powers, but you do not need a warrant for uh, spying, so collecting intelligence, uh, surveilling uh, uh, people who are, are agents of foreign powers or those powers themselves. Uh, let's see. Oh, interesting. When FISA was before the Senate, I worked there, and Griffin Bell came to us, and he said, you know, this bill doesn't recognize the president's independent power to conduct foreign intelligence, or intel uh, electronic surveillance. And he emphasized FISA does not take away the power of the president under the Constitution. But he said, that's all right. We don't even have to draw that line. Why? Because the president, by offering this legislation, is agreeing to follow the statutory procedure. In other words, you've got a gentleman's agreement between a sitting president and Congress saying the president will go to the FISA court. Perfectly legal. The president can, can you know, decide not to enforce his constitutional prerogatives. What he cannot do is make an agreement that binds any future president. But every president likes FISA. Why? Because if you work outside of FISA, you run a risk that if you try to go to court and have a criminal prosecution, some judge is going to say this is, not, this is an unreasonable search uh, and, throw, and throw it out so you can't convict the person. So they like it, and usually it works well. In wartime, it gets difficult when sometimes you've got a matter of hours before a bomb may blow up, and then you have to spend several days coll collecting a two-inch thick pack of paper, sending it around the government, and then getting in line to see the court. The court's wonderful but there are problems of, of, of losing speed in dispatch. All right, uh, we've already talked on that. Oh, uh, in addition to creating the FISA court, we created something called the FISA Court of Review, made up of federal appeals court judges appointed by the, by the Chief Justice. Its job was to consider appeals brought by the government from FISA court decisions. And in 2002, it issued a unanimous opinion in which it noted the Chung Court, as did all of the other courts to decide the issue, 
held the president had inherent authority under the Constitution to conduct warrantless searches to obtain foreign intelligence information. And they went on to say, we take it for granted the president does have that authority, and assuming that is so, FISA could not encroach on the president's constitutional power. So now you've got all of the courts of appeals to decide the issue, saying the president has this power. You've got the appellate court set up by FISA saying this. You've got the, the Supreme Court on uh, seven different occasions having an opportunity to place limits on this and refusing to do so. Now, the first time a case was appealed, three justices voted to grant cert. By the time Trump came to the Supreme Court, not a single justice wanted to question it. Now, ask yourself, the, judge, the justices do not have a duty to take cases. But if they believe that the government is violating the Fourth Amendment, obviously, they, they would take that seriously, and they would want to consider that case themselves. They have never done that. Now, my sub-theme, FISA expressly made 911 easier for the terrorists. Mike Hayden was the director of the NSA from 99 to 2005. He's expressed publicly the professional judgment that had the NSA uh, terrorist surveillance program been in effect in 2001, they would have identified some of the 911 hijackers as al-Qaeda operatives. He did not go on to say that if having done that, we might have paid attention to them and might have stopped those attacks. But that, follow, that strikes me as being a reasonable uh, uh, implication. How many of you remember Colleen Rowley, this, this nice lady right here in the middle who recently ran for Congress uh, two years ago, and, uh, and, and, and she, she's still, I think, looking for work. Uh, she was one of Time's three persons of the year in 2002 because she wrote a scathing memo to that idiot Bob Mueller, a graduate of our law school, so I have to defend him a little bit, saying that she, her FBI agents in Minneapolis identified Zacharias Massawi as a likely terrorist who was trying to learn how to fly an airplane but didn't want to learn how to land. This ought to trouble us a little bit. So she said, I want a FISA warrant so I can look at his laptop computer. And the idiots at FBI headquarters refused to even submit it to the court. And she was livid, and members of Congress were livid when they learned about it and wanted people fired, and it's these incompetent FBI guys that got us bombed. Now, there's more to the story. Raleigh was absolutely clueless about FISA. Indeed, there's a recent report from the uh, 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 Inspector General of the Department of Justice that in a footnote noted, even after we repeatedly explained it to her, she could not understand the statute. When Congress passed FISA, what it wanted to do was to make sure the government was not going to spy on the Jane Fondas of the world. And therefore, the only time you could get a FISA warrant was if it could be shown that the target was an officer, employee, or agent of a foreign power, foreign power being defined to include terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda. The problem with Massawi was there was no evidence he was an agent of a foreign power. He was what we call a cheerleader or a lone wolf or a fellow traveler. He hated America and wanted to blow us all up and was happy to work with anybody who wanted to do that, but he didn't, he didn't take money and he didn't take orders from Al-Qaeda. And they could not get, you know, Spy, uh, Scott has gone through a program we have at UVA every summer training law professors in national security law. He already knew it all, but he came through it just to make some friends. That was back when they were first setting up the center here. Best student we ever had in it. Anyway, uh, each year we also take some government lawyers, and we've had as many as eight FBI lawyers at a time, and I've talked to them, and their boss, the guy who was their boss, is one of my dearest friends. And they looked at this, and they said, hey, she has not come close to meeting the statutory predicate for a FISA warrant. And they went back to her and they said, Colleen, you can't get a FISA warrant for this, and if you surveil him without that, it's a felony under FISA. However, you may have enough evidence to get a criminal warrant. Why don't you go see the U.S. attorney and take that approach? But Colleen Rowley didn't like the U.S. attorney in Minneapolis, and so she didn't want to try that one. So instead, she screams, oh, the FBI wouldn't send this forward. Had they sent it forward, the Office of Intelligence Policy and Review would have sent it back. Had they gotten into a conspiracy and sent it forward, the court would have rejected it. It was not close. Uh, in fact, in uh, 2006, Senator Specter, who's been one of the strongest critics of the president on FISA, introduced a bill that noted in its, in its uh, prefatory language that uh, the FBI could not meet the requirements to obtain an order under FISA to search Masawi's laptop computer. So even one of the leaders of that side has acknowledged that. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Fourth Amendment because we don't have much time. Just real quickly here, 
First of all, fourth, uh, 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 not Harold Cole, sorry, uh, John Yu says there's a war constitution and a peace constitution. That's, that's silly. There is a constitution, and it applies equally in war and in peace. However, what is a reasonable and unreasonable search may well vary depending on what you're trying to prevent. If you're trying to prevent a massive catastrophic terrorist attack, the government is going to have a little more leeway in what they get away with than if they're trying to stop white-collar crime. Uh, the Supreme Court has repeatedly held that in certain areas, in non-law enforcement settings, uh, where there are special needs involving safety, security, what have you, uh, you do not have to have a warrant. Classic case, the Von Rabb case, the, the, the court noted, our decision in railway labor executives reaffirms the long-standing principle, neither a warrant nor probable cause, nor indeed any measure of individualized suspicion is indispensable uh, for reasonableness in every circumstance. Uh, our case is established when a Fourth Amendment intrusion serves special governmental needs beyond the normal needs for, for law enforcement. It's necessary to balance the privacy expectation against the government's interest to, to determine whether it's impractical uh, to require a warrant. Hague versus AG is one of several cases where the court has noted it's obvious and unarguable that no governmental interest is more compelling than the security of the nation. Uh, and the court goes on to note, as an example, every time I go to an airport, and that's these last few months, of, you know, in fact, last week and this week, that's, I, I spent four days out of town last week, and this is my second day out of town this week. This, actually, I drove this time. It doesn't count. But I fly a lot. And every time I go, I've got to get there an hour early, and I've got to take my shoes off and give them my laptop and so forth, and then they did this wand thing. It's embarrassing. And I try to put my shoes back on, and they're sitting over there giggling. Is he going to fall this time? You know, do we have to file an environmental impact statement if he falls? Uh, anyway, uh, but all, the Supreme Court has never decided this. Why? Because just like the exception for foreign intelligence, all of the circuits have been in agreement. And the court does not normally decide cases that don't need to be decided. If all the circuits are in agreement, the Supreme Court normally will take the case only if it thinks they're wrong. And so it's perfectly normal for it not to have decided this issue. But uh, the, as the Supreme Court noted here, all of the courts that have considered it have decided that these searches are reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. A lot of people say, oh, it's not a Fourth Amendment search because you don't have to fly. Uh, they tried that with me when I was testifying before the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And I said, well, yes, Mr. Chairman, but this morning when I came in here to, uh, uh, to testify, they searched me going into the building. Uh, where I was going to exercise my constitutional right to petition my government for redress of grievances. And uh, I still haven't gotten his response to that one. But anyway, but they quote Henry Friendly, one of the greatest appeals judges in, in, in the history of the country, is saying, when the risk is jeopardy to hundreds of human lives and millions of dollars of property inherent in the pirating or blowing up of a large airplane, that by itself satisfies the requirement of reasonableness. Obviously, terrorist attacks are even more uh, potentially more dangerous, killing thousands of people, conceivably hundreds of thousands if you're talking about spreading plague or smallpox or something like that. Uh, and so I would argue that these, in fact, I testified twice last year before the Senate Judiciary Committee on this and once this year before the House. Not a single member of either party said these searches, these intercepting calls from foreign terrorists to people in this country without a warrant uh, is unreasonable. And not a single person said we shouldn't do it. The whole argument is the president is not above the law. He has to do it the way Congress tells him to do it. Uh, now, just one concluding point. If you all don't know that, that, uh, that Scott uh, is in the drug business, but the FBI has a warrant for him. And I called him the other day saying I was coming down here. And in the process, I made some rather threatening comments about our incumbent president. This is all just a hypothetical. It really didn't happen. Uh, and they recorded that, and they're going to prosecute me next month for threatening the president without the slightest warrant or probable cause in advance. But what happened to my civil liberties? They were collateral damage. If the government has a warrant to listen to one party, they can record every word said on that telephone, and they can use it in court if they get evidence of a crime. Now, everyone agrees that it's not only legal, but it's the duty of the president in an authorized war to gather intelligence on the enemy, to try to listen to the phone conversations of the enemy. But what the critics are saying is, hey, we need a special rule here. It should be harder to try to stop a terrorist attack than it should be to, uh, uh, you know, pr to uh, prosecute a white-collar criminal. It is absolutely absurd 
Uh, we can talk about the data mining and stuff later. Let me stop at that point. And if anybody's really angry, I'd like to save the first question for somebody who's really unhappy. So who's, who's unhappy? So I'll let you have an arm wrestle and see who gets the first shot. Nobody. Okay, who's not unhappy? Yeah, you say, yes, sir, go ahead. Happy, but, um, I was wondering if you comment on the extent of the, the use of the wiretapping recently. Because I think that a lot of that position is not that President Kendrick cannot do it, but he's doing it a lot. Yeah, the, the answer to that is I've, I've been out of that business for 20, I left that, that business in 1984. I don't know any more than you do about it. What I do know is that when the story was, was published in the New York Times on December 16th, 2005, uh, they, they said that all of these wiretaps involved foreign nationals outside this country known or believed to be tied to Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or some other you know, related terrorist group. Uh, how, many, how many there are? I just don't know. Uh, but I don't have the sense. You know, one of the ironies is, everybody hates George Bush. I, I'm not a big Bush fan either. But if you compare his response on the civil liberties area to that of any wartime president, he has the best record. Why? You know, FDR arrested hundreds of thousands of American citizens, many of them born in this country who had never been to Japan. Their only sin was they had a grandfather who came from Japan and put them in an internment camp for years without so much as talking to a court or anything like that. What did George Bush do right after 911? He went to Congress and said, we need new legislative authority. And Congress passed laws. And most of the complaints are about those laws. It, it's, it really is it, it's, it's an unprecedented respect for civil liberties. I'm not saying that, that, that W, you know, had DWI convictions. My God, I, I really had trouble voting for him when I found out the only reason he didn't kill a family of kids is, is chance. Because once you get on the road and start driving drunk, it's purely chance that decides whether you kill a bunch of people or you get home alive. Anyway, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't, the, the basic question is, how often are they doing this? I don't know the answer to that. But uh, I, I, I certainly see no reason to believe uh, that, you know, they're, they're, they're doing, you know, what they're trying to do, they're, they're listening to people that are talking to foreign terrorists. My God, if there's any time we want to listen to bin Laden, it's when he's talking to somebody in this country that may be about to plant a bomb. Who's next? We got about eight minutes to go, I gather. Yes, ma'am. So assuming that the president has the unilateral power to conduct surveillance along with his foreign intelligence power, what's, like, the definition of the scope of what falls under that foreign intelligence. Where's the line for who falls within that and who doesn't? It's a very good question. Uh, thanks to, Ke to the Keith case, we have some answers. Uh, if it's a foreign intelligence, you know, it, in order to listen without a warrant, you have to show a connection between the, tar the individual and a foreign power. And then the question is, well, what, what's to protect the president from telling the NSA hey, listen to everything that John Kerry and Ted Kennedy and Obama do. And the answer to that is pretty simple. Anybody want to guess how many employees they are in the inspector general shop at National Security Agency? It's more than 100. They're not all Republicans. The reality is all of these kinds of programs, there are a lot of people who actually have knowledge of them. And if the president tried to, and presidents know this, you know, we had some, some, some uh, abuses of intelligence power, powers back in, uh, in the 60s, there's no question about it. We also had some, some congressional grandstanding that really misled the American people about how bad the intelligence community had done, and it led to the almost gutting of our human intelligence capability. And another way Congress bears responsibility for making 911 easy is they basically destroyed our ability to collect on-ground intelligence. They, uh, between the Carter administration and Stansfield-Turner, uh, they almost shut down CIA uh, 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 you know, on the ground people. In fact, I was down in, in Honduras investigating the Iran-Contra affair in 84, and the station chief of the CIA told me I had to start from scratch. The Carter people said, we won't need intelligence in Honduras, bring him home. And so this guy had to go down and start making all new contacts. It, it was absolutely, it was criminal in my view. It gave us very little ability to deal with, 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 uh, with problems. We had no one on the ground working for CIA in, uh, in Saddam's Iraq, I am told. I'm not sure if that's true, but uh, uh, a lot of harm was done. But, but, but you know, the, the point is there are lots and lots of checks there. Oh, the, the point I was going to make is, anybody want to guess for another $2 bill, how many people the church committee, they issued a report that was that thick on assassination. How many people did they, had, did they find the CIA had ever assassinated in its history? $2 for it. 
Did you say zero? Yeah. Come forward. Not a single case. They found two decisions by the CIA to assassinate people. Well, one of them, that's not true. They found two targets. There were several plots under Eisenhower. Glad I brought some $2 bills. I'd have to start giving out fives. I'll it's, take two ones uh, eight quarters. You say two ones, you're going to have to sit down. That's a Jefferson. Save that and cherish it. Anyway, the point is they found several plots to kill Castro. I think that was legal. Why? Castro was involved in all sorts of armed efforts to destabilize countries. He was sending in guerrillas, guns, and so forth, and people were getting killed. Under international law of self-defense, you can lose, use lethal force in collective self-defense. The OAS passed a resolution saying that if Castro doesn't stop what he's doing in Venezuela, measures of self-defense will be warranted. Uh, the other one was Lam Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. After they decided to kill him, he was fired by his own president, imprisoned, broke out of jail, was captured by a rival Marxist group, and was killed by them. So the CIA never killed anyone. It, but how many Hollywood movies do you see about all these CIA hitmen going around the world and losing their memories and stuff? It's all fantasy. And I think, what have we got about, we got a few more minutes, and of course, Scott. I, I just want to push you a little bit. Uh, in this group, uh, you had a slide up there, Mr. Turner, that said that all the courts of appeal that upheld the president's constitutional authority. You said the Trump case, but those courts of appeal decisions in the Trump case were prior to FISA, if I'm correct. Uh, the, well, actually, Trump was after FISA, well, but, it, facts, it, but the facts occurred before. You're also, exactly right. And, and the repeat of that assertion in the uh, Fisker opinion of 2002 again refers to those same opinions. So, yeah. uh, how do you respond to the fact? that they would say, well, your argument is based on constitutional authority before Congress sought Yeah, it, it's, it's a very simple answer. And in fact, it, it, the one case that is very clearly after FISA is a FISA court of review unanimously saying, if the president has this power given by the people of the Constitution, Congress can't take it away by statute. And, and the issue there really, and John Moore and I, I argue this a lot, John is my co-founder of our center, is it an exclusive presidential power? And I think the parallel with the power of, to conduct diplomacy is a close one, and also the power to conduct military operations. And in both cases, the Supreme Court has said Congress cannot interfere in, in diplomacy. And the, the, the Supreme Court has said as late as, late as June of two years ago that uh, Congress cannot interfere with the conduct of military operations. So I think the answer is yes, it is an exclusive power. And the fact that the appellate court set up by FISA has unanimously said this statute cannot take away a constitutional power, suggests to me that, that they share the view that this is a constitutional power granted exclusively to the president that uh, you know, neither the courts nor Congress can take away. And you know, that, that's the answer to it. You, you may not like that answer. And again, we can, we can amend our constitution anytime we want if we're patient and have a lot of people that support us. Uh, we've got time for probably one more question, and I guess we have to be out of here by quarter after. So who's, uh, who's really unhappy or really happy or just... Uh, doesn't feel they get credit for the lecture if they don't ask a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I think if you assume that the president, of the, that the executive has this power, I think one of the, one of the criticisms is that uh, it's unchecked or that it's disorganized and that it's, it's abused by certain people who are not, don't have the correct kind of oversight. So I guess in your experience, what kind of, of, of sort of interagency checking is there within the executive for this kind of thing? What should there be? That's such a nice question to ask me because I spent three years of my life being the lawyer in the White House, whose job it was to oversee this kind of stuff. And let me tell you the first thing that surprised me about that job. The people in the intelligence community are, as a group, wonderful people who want to obey the law. Uh, they are, the exceptions, you know, you're talking about tiny fractions of fractions of a percent. They don't always understand the law. Often they would come to me and said, is this okay? But it's very rare. You know, the, the kinds of abuses you get. I remember one case where a military colonel or lieutenant colonel uh, had used his access to intelligence databases to, I've forgotten whether it was his ex-wife's new boyfriend or his daughter's boyfriend, but to see if he could find anything dirty on them. Uh, he uh, found a new job very quickly without any retirement from the military. Uh, the military and the intelligence communities throw the book at people who, viol who abuse these powers. It is a felony to conduct surveillance uh, outside of FISA. Now, I would argue that, that, you know, that, that, that you know, that's an illegal uh, statute, so it, its effect is, a, is, is, is arguable. But there is, in the White House, a, a, an office 
you know, headed by, or actually headed by distinguished private citizens, but uh, on a day-to-day -day basis run by a lawyer, that used to be me, uh, that deals regularly with all of the intelligence communities, with the heads of the agencies, with the General's, Cou General Cou General's Council and the Inspectors General, uh, they have to report any activity that they believe may be a violation of the law to that office. Uh, I thought they, you know, w went overboard telling me about things that were not even arguably, uh, you know, problems, but they really want to do the job right. There are hundreds of people involved in this. There is now, of course, this congressional oversight. Uh, I was offered the job of Chief of Staff of the Senate Intelligence Committee, which I actually helped write the statute to set up back in 76. This was in 85 when they offered it. And I said, I don't think there ought to be a Senate Intelligence Committee, so I appreciate the offer, but I'm, uh, you would not like me if I took the job. And, uh, uh, you know, this, you've heard a brief summary of the reason. Actually, the whole case is much stronger than this. But my own sense is we do not have a problem. Are there cases of abuse? I would be shocked if they're not. Just like there are cases of abuse, we, the president is empowered in the Constitution to authorize generals, to authorize colonels, to authorize sergeants, to authorize privates to pull the trigger when they think somebody is an enemy soldier. Is there ever a case when a soldier said, hey, look at that chick over there, you know, let me take some target practice. Yeah, you have soldiers who commit murder uh, abusing their, their combatant privilege. Uh, and it would be wonderful if we could say before the government, the military can fire a missile at a building believed to be an Al-Qaeda safe house, they would have to come back before a federal judge and prove beyond reasonable doubt that there's no one in that building but Al-Qaeda people and so forth. The problem is, four or five months later when that's done, those people are gone and they've killed a lot of Americans in the process. You cannot, you have to have speed and dispatch to win wars. And so we have to give, you have cases where some soldier tokes a you know, little pot the night before and programs in the wrong coordinates for the missile and you hit an orphanage instead of a safe house. You have cases where Al-Qaeda will leak us intelligence information and tell us the orphanage over there is really a meeting of bin Laden and his people. And we may say, okay, it's good enough intelligence, we're going to blow that building up and instead a bunch of dead kids come out of it. It happens in war, it's horrible. The idea that the government might inadvertently or through some individual abuse wind up reading one of your emails or one of my emails is trivial given the things that happen in war that are truly horrible because of mistakes. But there is no evidence of any grand conspiracy to spy on private citizens or something like that. All they're trying to do is to try to listen, to check out why is bin Laden talking to this uh, Saudi graduate student who's a PR, a permanent resident alien, and thus is protected by the Fourth Amendment every bit as much as we are, why are they talking? And if he talks about the Lincoln Tunnel and explosives, we're going to listen. And if he talks about, hey, I just bought the lamp you sold on eBay, you know, send it to uh, General Delivery Islamabad, I hope we're going to listen and have somebody waiting outside the post office to try to follow someone. But a lot of, you know, they may find out that somebody whose telephone is talking to terrorists is a pizza parlor. Nobody gets punished because you talk to terrorists. That makes you a subject of interest, and they try to check to say, is this person somebody trying to kill Americans? Uh, and I think they would be derelict in their duty if they didn't do it. Anyway, we, we got to get out of here. Okay. I'll be outside for a little bit if you want to talk yeah, some and, more. And, and I think the NSA probably has a good tape of this presentation, so if you want to hear it again. Yes. Uh, but anyway, uh, obviously, uh, play, join so. me in thanking Professor Turner. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs>